Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Erica Rosiska, and welcome to Rent Facts's July webinar. Um, actually, a continuation of um, our previous webinar in May, which is, um, you know, trying to figure out what is a good investment, investment or a bad investment in SFR real estate, and. Um, we, we walked you through kind of a quick model as a way of assessing risk. And um, to continue on, we wanted to actually go through a case study with you um, to help you really understand um, how to apply that risk model in, with an actual property. So um, moving on, um, I, again, I just wanted to introduce uh, the host today, Scott Abbey. He's the co-founder of RentFax and he's um, been in property management for um, quite a number of years. And um, me, I'm the president of RentFax. So uh, at the moment, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Stephen, who's controlling the webinar today. He'll just tell you a few uh, general guidelines about um, how to interact with the webinar and interact with, with us as hosts and ask questions. So take it away, Stephen. Thank you, Erica. So in regards to asking a question, uh, please feel free to ask at any time. However, we will address the questions at the um, end of the webinar. And if you have a question, you can use the uh, control panel um, on your screen. There is a question section. And uh, feel free to either type in your message or uh, raise your hand using the, the hand raise icon. If you raise your hand, you don't have to type anything in. And we'll unmute your line to then ask um, the question that way. Uh, so feel free to uh, raise your hand at any time or ask a question at any time, and we'll definitely address those at the end of the webinar. Thank you. Okay. Um, so one of the first things that, that we're going to talk about is just kind of a, a quick refresher, and um, I'll, I'll be turning it over to Scott here shortly to do so, but uh, in the last webinar, we really talked about kind of that quick model to assess income risk with SFRs, and um, Scott shared a bit about his model. If you had, didn't attend the last webinar, uh, we do have it available to go back and, and uh, listen to. And if you want to hear a little bit more about this model in depth, I think we kind of go into that. Um, Scott is going to highlight it today, but just wanted to, to mention that in case, um, in case you missed the last one. So um, without further ado, here's uh, Scott Abbey. Hello everyone, thank you for taking the time to come join us today. We're looking forward to our conversation and I would encourage questions at the end of this. I'll try to be brief so that um, I think the questions generally yield the best uh, value for the participants. But So let's do a quick review. The, the, the market as we all know is very, very tight. There's little inventory and one has to act very quickly so that when we have an opportunity we need to make a quick assessment. And there's a variety of ways to assess what is a good uh, real estate investment, what is not. But what we've found in our helping our clients is that there needs to be something that we can do very rapidly without having to acquire a lot of data. Uh, some people will use cap rates, which require a considerable amount of, of data gathering to be able to provide an accurate cap rate. What I recommend is a um, I call it the acquisition cost to rent ratio. And what is, the heck is that? Well, basically what I'm doing is I'm looking at what it cost me to purchase the property, what it cost me to fix the property up, and I compare that to my best estimate of monthly rent. And I do that because that is, those are readily available numbers that we can provide in data. Uh, the, the one caveat is understanding the cost of repair, and we'll talk about that shortly here, but it's very easy to determine what the selling price is because your, your seller is already giving you that. It's pretty easy to come up with the rent. We use, uh, we use our tool, the rent radar, to give you a rent ratio, or give you the, the estimated rents based on real comps that are in proximity to the subject. But what's really important is the risk of the neighborhood or the, the, the area risk as it relates to the ability to expect an ongoing, uninterrupted income stream. 
And so we use the risk index for determining what that risk is. More importantly, we correspond to the risk value of the subject property, a ratio value that you're willing to accept. And this ratio is totally yours. It's your business rule. I've fashioned this by working with multiple clients. And as you see in the, in the slide here, it's, it's got a range. And that range is essentially there to help guide the investor in deciding what is an opportunity to pursue and what is an opportunity not to pursue. It also helps establish whether or not the transaction needs to be purchased at the asking price or to offer a lower cost and justify that cost based on the data that you've compiled. And so we, we, we have, and the best example would be you, you find a house that costs $90,000 and you um, going to have to put $10,000 in repair. You have an all-in acquisition cost of $100,000 and you have a rent monthly estimate based on the, the averages, the, the uh, predicted range that we can provide you uh, at $1,000. That ratio would be 1.0. And if you look at the 1.0 range there, uh, what we're looking for is a, um, an opportunity to purchase a property that has a risk index that corresponds to that, that value. If it doesn't correspond to that value, then you, you may want to ask, you may want to offer a lot less for the asking price, or you may want to find a way to trim down some of your repair costs. Um, but be that said, I want to dive into this particular example Go ahead and go to the next slide, if you would. This is a little house in a city south of Kansas City. Uh, investor purchased it. The um, investor looked at this house, and it matched. It met the criterion that they wanted. They had a very specific criteria as to uh, what kind of price they were willing to pay and what kind of ratio return they were going to be able to achieve. So when we go into this house, we discover that um, go down inside the basement and it's moldy and it's yucky down in the basement. And it's one of those basements that's had some water issues that's evident. And this is, I'll, I'll share this with you. Uh, properties that have had some basement disruption that have had some water issues can be some of the best values you can find because oftentimes the seller is nervous he can't sell it and the buyers are nervous to buy it because of the unknown. Experience has taught me, and I'm sure many of you in this group are aware of this, but there's basically two kinds of water problems that we face. We have a water management issue that's poorly managed, or we are sitting in a hole that we can't do anything about. And if we're sitting in a hole that we can't do anything about, I would walk from that property. But if we have an issue with water management, then by all means, this should be one to be considered. So when we went in this house, we found this odor and obvious signs of water intrusion. When we went to the back of the house, we discovered, and this picture that you're looking at now is a post-construction picture, but we discovered that that entire run of guttering on the back of that house was fed by one single gutter that led right to the patio. The patio, which was adjacent to the basement, had created a concave from the water, and it basically became a pool for the water to settle, which then caused the water intrusion in the basement. You might go to the next slide, Stephen. So for a very modest price, we went into the project and put simple French drains in, moved the water now to three outlets as opposed to one, and we just had a ginormous rainstorm uh, just a couple of days ago, and this system was able to keep up with the downflow of water because we distributed the water differently. And this has enabled this, this buyer to buy this house at a price that became very attractive. So our, our net in this house was 120 k with the repairs that were done. The property rented the repairs were done in about two weeks. The property rented in about three weeks. It rented for $12.95. So we were actually able with this particular house to 
be able to make a fast assessment. It was on the market for a very short time. Make a fast assessment. Go in and do a quick survey of construction. And if you go, would uh, Stephen, go to the next slide. We made after we had made the offer on the house. We went in and did a very complete and detailed examination of the work that needed to be done. But before we made the offer on the house, we used our resources to determine what needed to be done in the house. And this is really the most important part of the due diligence when you're looking at a property is going in and making a quick assessment of those things that need to be done and being able to do it in such a way so that it does, you don't have to wait for days to get a bid because virtually every construction resource that you might speak to is overwhelmed right now in work and bids are some of the most challenging things to get. So it's, it behooves you to learn how to make reasonably fast assessments or find a resource who can make reasonably fast assessments to survey the property so that you can determine what needs to be done in that property to sell it. At the end of this, this, this property investor was able to find this property, make an offer. Well, first we found the property, we did an assessment, we did an assessment of the risk of the neighborhood, of the rents, we established what the all-in ratio was. The ratio fit the investor's objectives and it fit the projected objectives for the risk of the neighborhood. We were able to get the work done and the property rented at a number slightly above what we had budgeted. So this is the kind of speed that is now needed in the marketplace so that you can find and successfully bring to a close properties that will fit. The critical thing is to understand whether the property fits your your objectives. And this is where this ratio becomes so important. Stephen, go back to the ratio if you would. And I emphasize this very importantly. This ratio is our, to our method of assessing those numbers. This is something that you can easily do on your own. You may, may have completely different numbers, but what I can tell you from 25 years of property management, you must consider the neighborhood when considering the risks, the, the, the margins or the investment yields that you want to accept. You may very likely miss good opportunities because your expectation is too high and you may way underestimate the risk with a margin that doesn't afford itself enough margin in your transactions to absorb the things that may happen as a result of demographics in the neighborhood. So again, this is a, a fast way to set up a business rule for your investment portfolio, your search. Does the property bear the, does the initial number say, yes, we should go and look and do a, a survey of what needs to be done, get a quick survey, add the survey to the purchase price and what your goals are. Does it fit? Will it seller accept it, go under contract, get a five day or 10 day inspection period, go in and get a firm number on what your repairs are going to be required. And if it's all match, then you go forward with the, with the transaction. On the rent side, if Stephen, if you go to the various uh, index numbers. First, this is your risk number. And then this particular place, this house is right in the center of the, of the spectrum. Uh, probably the most ideal place to be if you want to optimize cash flow and a future appreciation. And then Stephen, go to the next. This is the predicted range. And what we do is we go out and pull uh, as many comps as we can to determine the mean average, the 60% the probability and what I typically do is simply pick the average between those two predicted ranges as my, my number for establishing the, um, uh, the ratio. And with that information, and show them the, the vacancy. In the vacancy, if the vacancies are much above 5%, you will have to trim down that, that rent number. And if your risk numbers are uh, below 35, you want to turn down the, the rent numbers. 
higher risk properties generally require less rents in order to attract the quality of tenant that is desired. So a combination of vacancy and risk helps decide where on that predicted rent range you want to establish your targets. Higher risk, lower rents. Higher vacancy, lower rents. On the, on the opposite side, when you get into lower risks and lower vacancies, you can push to the higher end of those rents. Those are all tools that are available for you to make fast decisions and then hopefully have a successful experience with your investment. So that's pretty much my spiel. I promised it would be short. Glad to answer any questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to click the hand raise icon or feel free to um, punch in the uh, question you have in that text box there and we'll uh, definitely get, uh, definitely be glad uh, to, to answer your questions. Uh, let's see here. Someone said, I like that report. Where uh, would I uh, get that report and how much does it cost? Well, we, we use, it's Rentfax Pro is the website, R-E-N-T-F-A-X-P-R-O.com. And um, there's pricing information on the website. So you can go there and uh, view the, the website, and it makes it pretty straightforward. In fact, if you go there, you can actually order a free report of a target that you want to look at. And uh, I find it very affordable because when you're considering the, the magnitude of, of the cost of a piece of real estate, uh, these reports are invaluable in terms of just helping assist you in doing what's uh, making the best decision you can for your investment. All right. Any other questions? Scott, I have a question. Um, on your case study example, yes. can you review where they fell on, in terms of their ratios and sure. what the risk was associated with that? Sure. If you go back to the ratio screen. There you go. Um, this particular property came in uh, as a 50. So if you, if you go down the scale, the risk number, at 45 to 50, which as you can see there is a description, good balance between cash flow and appreciation with the bias towards cash flow. And what, we're, what we use as an average goal is a 0.95 ratio, which would mean the all-in cost of the purchase compared to the monthly rent, which in this case we beat that. Uh, we actually did better than that number in this particular transaction. We had a, an all-in cost of 120 with a monthly rent of 1295. But when we calculated this, by the way, just for estimate, we didn't use 1295 as our estimated rent. We were more conservative in our estimated rent. The market just happened to be very hot at that moment in time and we were able to capture a higher rent. Any other questions? Quiet group. Anyone else got a question? I do see one in there. Um, yes. In fact, we have a, a few here. Someone mentioned that they look through the different reports that um, RentFax offers, and they find it confusing uh, to decide which one they should use. Well. Uh, we're actually going to be doing some revamp in that arena, but um, my advice to most is if you use the rent package, the rent package, which includes a detailed risk report, a rent analysis, and a vacancy report, that package is what I use, and that's the only report I pull. It gives me all the data I need in one concise report. Uh, if you're just looking for a risk number, that's all you care about. You don't care about the backup supporting data on that, which after you use this report, you may not. Just use a risk summary. But when you pull a, a rent package, there's economy in using the rent package because it gives you the rents and the vacancy at the same time. So 
if you proceed forward with your with your projected uh, purchase, you'll need those numbers to do your vetting. And I think that answers our last question. It says, I'm new to rent facts. Exactly which report gives the average rent? Uh, that would be, there's two, two ways to get to that. There's the rent radar report, which is just rents, or it's embodied in the rent package. Fantastic. I also see we did we do have one more question on um, the reports from Dan, and he wanted to know an outline of what each report has and who it is best for. And so I know we talked a little bit about um, the outline of the the risk um, summary in detail, and then the rent radar and and rent package um, could. Do you want to maybe speak to the pro forma and, and who that might be best for too? Well, the pro forma is a, it's a tool to help you uh, simulate the costs associated with your investment. It's a, it's a more, it would be a more detailed approach to the, your assessment. Uh, I've basically short-circuited that report by using this ratio that I've presented to you. Um, but it, it, got, it gathers up what the anticipated um, management fees would be, it gathers up the um, taxes, and it estimates insurance. And those are those are numbers which investors some some investors want to try to get that granular in their decision making. Uh, I find that it's it's a fine report and it does it quick. But uh, for me, I I like a faster uh, pass at the at the um, information because. The, the problem is that you still have to validate some of those. If you're going to use that approach in estimating cost, you, you really got to validate your, your insurance because it can be a variable. You, you have to validate for sure that the property manager that you know is going to charge the rate that the report is predicting. And those variables, uh, that validation process adds time to the vetting. And in the environment we're in right now, you just don't have time. You've got to act fast. We have another question. So the acquisition ratio is the total cost divided by one month of rent. Is that correct? Correct. I do want to circle back to, to the question about um, the reports and who it is best for. Um, all, the, all the reports have an application where an investor would utilize the uh, risk information as well as the rent information. A property manager would utilize that information. A, a lender would utilize that information. So really anybody in the real estate professional world that is um, analyzing a, an investment property, a residential investment property, would have a use for um, any and all of these reports. Okay, do we have any, any more, Stephen? I don't, I don't think I see I think any more questions. Question. So. Yeah, All right, well, thank you so much, everybody, for attending um, our, our deeper dive into our case study webinar, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Are we offline?